For those of you that don't know, Jason Kuhn, uh, Wesleyan, West Virginia alumni, former athlete, current athlete, we'll talk about that in a minute. Old man athlete, yeah. Official ambassador for Triton Poker and also an official ambassador for GG Poker. So again, thanks Jason for taking the time. Of course. We just wanted to catch up on some things poker, some things sport. First of all, first time in Vietnam? Yes. Give me your impressions. Uh, it was a long way to get here from Vegas. Um, and once I got here, I, I was blown away. I mean, the rooms, the uh, poker food for me is always a challenge. Like uh, just a, a month ago, I was in the Bahamas and it was immediate, we were in a five-star hotel and I was immediately aware like, oh, I, I just can't eat anything here. Not, PCA, right? Yeah, yeah, I can't eat anything here. And then I show up to here and everything's healthy, everything is incredible. Um, so this is just a dream stop for me. I think we were chatting earlier. Could be the best poker stop we've ever been on. Yeah, when you think poker, you want everyone to be comfortable, like the gaming space, and then be able to escape to their quiet, safe places. And this is amazing. The beach is great. The rooms are gigantic and brand new. For me, the gym, the sauna, everything is just, this is the perfect package for me. What do you reckon the things I've heard most often from the American players about what they love about here? Um, the rooms. I mean, the, that's always the, the thing that's up in the air. A lot of these stops, even if you go to a, like the guys were just in Paris playing EPT Paris, and mm. they were like, you know, beautiful city, but my room is the size of a closet, and I can't even fit my stuff in here. And you can hear everybody stomping around above you and around you, and here everything's just tranquil and plenty of space. By the way, not everybody's room's quite like yours, but, uh, okay. the, the, but to be fair, even the average rooms are pretty good. <laughs> the other thing I heard from people like Eric and stuff like that is they're loving the fact that there's no smoke here. Yeah. Of course, on the Asia, tours in Asia, often people, there's a lot of smokers, but because the way they've set it up is so good, mm. there's just no smoke anywhere. And yeah. um, it's, uh, because I know how crazy people go, if you walk through the Bellagio and somebody's smoking and it goes nuts, right? Yeah, and I mean, I had several years of being with this crowd where I was sitting in a in a box somewhere with 10 people blowing smoke in my face and I've endured enough days for a hundred lifetimes so coming here and getting to breathe fresh air is uh, amazing. You're sponsored by, well sponsored by and you represent two Asian originating poker brands, yep. GG and Triton. Tell me about how you first met the guys, how you got involved and how your poker world sort of got taken a tangent because of people that are unknown to a lot of the, the sort of poker playing community in the US. How's that come about? As an American, I was hearing folk tales when, uh, when Macau opened up of the legendary games and how big they were and the scales and the characters that were there. And I was pretty early to go over there. I wasn't... I remember when you came. Yeah, exactly. I was pretty early to go over there and basically everything everyone thought would be true was true. Um, which and, is rare in poker, by the way. Which is rare. The scale, the games were great. And the first night that I had played with Paul, I think in the Aussie Millions, same with Richard, but we didn't really get a chance to get uh, to know each other until we were in Manila playing a really high stakes cash game. And I could tell that Paul, um, I immediately bonded with Paul because he could see in my face that the stakes were big enough to scare me at the time. And I was kind of like, what am I doing here? This game is very big. And I, I just sensed that he, even though he was competing against me, he really wanted me to be comfortable. And he made a lot of efforts to make me comfortable and being like a, a lone American in a room in Manila somewhere, that was really special to me. Mm. And through that relationship with Paul and Richard, that's how you, you know, started working with Triton. You know? Yeah, well, Triton, it, it was just, it was one of those things that even the first Triton I showed up to was in Macau. It might've been the third Triton ever, maybe the second. Um, and the second I walked into the room, I was like, this is just different. Um, they were doing a champagne toast when they, we were doing the shuffle up and deal. And there were all these larger than life characters there. And it was a gigantic buy-in. And I could just tell, like, I knew that these guys were obsessed with poker. But the brand of Triton was built out of love for the experience of playing poker. And that has never changed. So um, the ambassadorship came from me literally being like, guys, I love this so much. If there's anything I can do to help promote this, like I believe in this brand. And it was, you know, we were all good friends and they were like, yeah, let's, let's just do it, you know. No, it's great. I mean, I think, I think it's a great two-way relationship. You know, um, you know, you're, 
if you read the poker media, you're always referred to as one of the top players in the world. And I think it's, it's, it's great that you've, what I would regard as the best tournament series in the world. Yes, it's high roll. It's not as big as the WSOP. Mm -hmm. The fields aren't as big, but from a quality perspective. Yes. Uh, you know, WPT used to run some great, uh, has run a, recently run a fantastic tournament, which everybody's been raving about. Mm -hmm. And they did their WPA, whatever it was called back. You remember they had those high rollers, WPT did a yeah, series. Alpha of, yeah, Alpha 8. Yeah, Alpha 8, that's it. Yeah, I actually fell asleep at the table in one of those. <laughs> <laughs> man, man, I remember the one they did one in Hard Rock. Remember, and uh, uh -huh. we went to that, and I had a big night out. And Matt Savage said, "You need to be here for twelve o'clock." I was like, "Really?" And I got there, and I was so tired, I actually fell asleep mid-game for you an hour. You know, you're a baller when you fall asleep in a super high roller tournament. No, it was not good. I didn't do very well, as <laughs> usual. Um, and then Gigi, how did Gigi come up? So Gigi, for those of you that on, from the sporting news side aren't so familiar, is now by far, if you go to a we measure the size of poker sites on Poker Scout, which yeah. is a site which shows you all of the poker sites around the world and, and how many players are playing concurrently, what their averages are. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't realize, they've all heard of Poker Stars, is that GG Poker is multiple times larger than anything else out there. Yes. So how did you end up meeting them, or, or how did that relationship come about, and what do you do for GG Poker? So, uh, as you were saying, GG is an absolute juggernaut. And the first thing that I noticed about GG um, was the quality of the product. So whenever I played it, I was like, wow, the software is ridiculous. It's super fast. It's really clean. Um, just the user experience was really great, and that captivated me. And then once I got to know um, the executives and uh, the main folks at GG, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to name drop or not, so I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, I was blown away at uh, their plans for the future, um, just their overall business acumen and their goals and it was very clear to me that GG is going to win and they're going to win big. They have won. Yeah, and they're going to continue to win. And they said, uh, we, were, we were talking and they were like, how would you like to help us with site security? And um, from that, uh, a larger role for me has come about, but the beginning was, I'm obsessed with poker, I love poker, I cut my teeth playing online poker, um, in university, and it was a beautiful, beautiful way for me to start a career. And poker, specifically online, there's tons of threats now. Couldn't be more obvious. Yeah. And um, understanding the way that AI works and study tools work and the way that people are wep weaponizing them against players, um, I'm, I'm doing my best to help lead a fight against, against cheating. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. We we were discussing earlier. We've seen around the world a sort of growth in land-based tournaments. It's becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about some of the sort of fun tournaments you go to later. And there's personally, I feel that online poker is really challenged by that. The tools are so good. The bots, the all the other things that people can use. Being at the tables is still you need to be there. And we were discussing earlier some of the best online players. Just just because they're at that end of the spectrum, just don't do so well at the table. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Even though poker at its core is a fundamental scientific mathematics based game, there's still a gigantic human element. And mm. if you're not comfortable in your own skin, if you don't have a solid understanding of the way that people's emotional responses are at the table, the way that you're, you're perceived, um, the psychological elements in the poker, just having confidence in yourself in your own skin, a lot of those things result into um, winning or losing. and so you can see a, a guy who's played millions of hands online who's just an absolute monster sit down at a poker table and you're just like, oh, I just know you don't have a hand because you're so, whatever it may be, mm, there's inconsistencies the with them that, yeah, they don't realize that they're total tell boxes. And, um, and that's the beauty of poker is it's the, this giant, beautiful um, collage of tons of different elements that can create a winning monstrous poker player and the this type of winner may be completely different from this type of winner it's a beautiful game because there's still several different ways to be able to carve out a win talking something that crosses online and land based everybody's raving about the triton app it's the first time i've used it at a tournament so it's a you know standard poker tournament app which shows you what's going on but as a player we're in the tournament it's brilliant they scan your qr code and in real time you get to see everybody else's chip stacks around them, every single hand that's played. And that only really works at a high stakes tournament because you can't have too many tables. Mm -hmm. But what Triton have done is they've got an individual standing next to each table that's recording every hand, everybody's chip stack in real time. Mm -hmm. How much 
does having that information as a, to a prop top player like you, how much does that help you? So um, I've heard a lot of people debate whether it is good or bad to have this system. I personally love it, but I'm also not a person who is buried in my phone when I play. Mm. So for me, I think it's really entertaining to... If I see a person uh, in the chip lead and I'm on break, I'll say, oh, how did they get that chip lead? And pull it up and go through a couple hands. And it's fun as, as you're actively playing, you can spectate. And I've noticed a lot of players are just in their phone the whole time sweating every single hand. Mm. That doesn't work for me because it kind of takes me out of the moment. But as an overall user experience, just having all of this data available and just being like, did that play really happen? I've noticed it's created a ton of fun dialogue in circles where people will blow by and just be like, did you see this hand? Did you see this hand? Wow, they have the chip lead again. So it just creates another element of being in for the sweat. And that's what we all want, right? Yeah. Like, we all want to sweat. So it's just uh, yeah, it's a deeper level of being able to sweat the action. If you've got horses in the field, it's pretty it's good It's really too, right? great. There's no, no making up your, you got aces versus kings. It's yeah, like, nah, right. you busted. Get rid of all that bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's fantastic. And, you know, Sporting News, we're trying to work out how to integrate that product live so people can follow it. I think it's fantastic. And, uh, you know, and I think what they've done with the TV setups as well is, is really cool. Let's go back to your university days. Um, you pretend to be an athlete, were an athlete. I've got <laughs> yeah. this great T-shirt which says, the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> yeah, for sure, the faster so I was. give me a bit about you. Got a, I understand you've got an academic and athletic scholarship. Yeah. How did that come about? Yeah, so in high school... Um, you know, I was, I'm from uh, middle of nowhere in West Virginia, which uh, if you're not American is, is the, if it's not the poorest state in the United States, it's the second poorest state. Um, and uh, I, the, one, the one thing that I, I had going for me from the time I could walk was everyone was like, wow, Jason's really athletic. Um, so it was obvious to me that I had the natural gift. Um, and by the time I, I was in high school, I was... Um, a very good baseball player, pretty good football player, and I and I had quite a lot of speed. But entering my um, my eleventh grade year of high school, it was apparent to me that track and field was what was going to really move the needle for me in terms of getting a, a scholarship. And I was really set to be uh, to go to university. I was the first person in my family to ever go to college, and I promised my mom I would do it. And um, so I actually graduated high school to go play football at a university in, in Pennsylvania and I just didn't like the vibe and I meshed really well with a track coach in West Virginia. So I went back to Wesleyan University or Wesleyan College and I ran track there for five years and got a, a master's in business administration. Yeah, she's funny, I only found that out today. You know, I always knew you were a bit of a poker guru. I never knew what the background was. And you obviously, you're in amazing shape and uh, you train all the time. And just coming into your room early, I noticed there's like 300 supplements. <laughs> Give me a super quick run through yeah. what you take every day and why. So uh, traveling is exceptionally hard on you, at least with me. I'm very, very sensitive. When I'm back home, all of my food is controlled. The times that I eat are controlled. I know which window I'm eating food and I don't track like calories or macros, but I just, I, I'm, I'm very dialed in with what works for my body. But when I travel, generally food is a problem. Here it isn't. It's amazing. I'm eating these steamed cods and all these yeah. great steamed vegetables and fruits, and it's just uh, fantastic. But I always bring a million different backups. So I travel with 70 pounds of, of Epsom salts and foods and supplements. And um, so the main thing for me here is, uh, is to keep my gut in play like I feel like the gut goes your trip your trip is screwed right so a lot of the stuff that I bring here is digestive health and um, not as much like protein bars and jerkies even though I play with those but but it's 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 really more just like lots of probiotics prebiotics digestive enzymes hydrochloric acid a bunch of different supplements um, and then like I said I travel with like 20 pounds of salts because every single night rather than drinking a, a beer or two to kind of knock myself out I pour um, an Epsom salt bath every night and just soak in that. And the last two nights, I've actually fallen asleep in the bathtub, which is kind of terrifying. <laughs> but it works really well for knocking you out. I never knew about that. Yeah. And, you know, I remember when I used to go to Vegas, the super top-end players would have their own RV parked in the car park, yeah. Daniel and Phil. Uh -huh. And they used to go up, break, and eat there uh -huh. because, you know, the, the canteen's pretty horrible. Yeah. How important do you think food, diet, nutrition, supplements – is to your poker play. We'll talk about athletics in a minute. Obviously, there it's for. Do you think it? What you do, you know, it, it, it's it assists you with poker. 
I, I think it's one of the most important things that I've, I've done. Like poker is about longevity and it's about damage control. It's the best poker players in the world aren't necessarily the flashiest. They're the people who consistently win and don't give away anything over the long run. So I noticed that early in my career, if I was out drinking and partying and I'd show up and you know play hungry, my brain would just crash and I would end up making some gigantic mistake that I would never make in the normal state of mind. Now, mind you, I, I haven't been in a situation like that in over 10 years, but if I get hungrier, my blood sugar drops, I'm, I'm much more likely to, to make a mistake at the poker table. So just being able to control that is, um, being able to never play your C game is one of the most important things in poker. It's not just like a tilt element of controlling your emotions, that's a big thing, but also just making sure that when everyone else is getting tired that you're not, it's a massive edge over the long run. You take such good care of yourself. Talk me through what went wrong recently when you went too far. Yeah, so I'm a bit obsessive compulsive and um, I'm so inspired in Vegas. I'm training at a gym that's a bunch of professional football players, UFC fighters, baseball players, um, elite athletes. And the options are all there for me to, to train, to do everything I can do for, like overall I'm just training to age well, but right now I'm, I'm doing a bunch of movement-based athletic training and I just decided that I could do five or six days a week on top of a huge poker schedule, business schedule, family time. Um, and I overdid it and most likely just blew out all of my adrenaline and my immune system got low and I went to play the Bahamas PCA and I had I got some virus and I just laid in a bed with a 103 degree temperature for three days and then flew home without playing a single hand of poker. So I immune believe I crash. overtrained. Yeah. So you're going to listen to your trainers a bit more next time? Yeah, so. yeah. I should listen to the people that are telling me I need to recover a little more and, and take it easy. And, and, you know, people are like, hey, you're 37, um, you're not 21. And I'm like, uh, it doesn't matter. And it kind of matters. Quick one. Quick fire question without you knowing what I'm asking. Uh, top five athletes or five athletes you really admire and why in the States, pro, amateur? Okay. So I'm, I'm a massive uh, track and field fan. Uh, Allison Felix, uh, the greatest, one of the greatest uh, female sprinters, greatest sprinter all around, just incredible. Um, she she had the maybe the longest career, I believe even her last Olympics, which I might have been her fifth Olympics. It was at least her fourth Olympics. She silver medaled. I think it was her fourth Olympics. The unbelievable run. So it'd be Allison Felix. Uh, I've been playing poker lately, that's kind of a name drop, but I've been playing with Draymond Green, amazing guy, what a competitor, really, really bright, sees the big picture, just super inspiring guy. I like the people that, are, that have the calm minds. I like the people that are just in control of themselves and calm in the biggest, uh, biggest high-pressure situation. So if you take you know, all of the true masters at their, at their peak, like uh, Tiger Woods at his peak, someone like that. It just Calm. Yeah, just seeing them like when... Everybody else would snap at the pressure, and they just get better and better and better the more, the more heat that's on them. I think that, that I feel that over, overlap in poker. Like There are just certain people that are just gamers, and you see them grow in confidence while everyone else crumbles. And I value that, and I think that that's, that's one of the greatest strengths of a high-stakes poker player is just to be able to remove attachment to anything and actually thrive under pressure. So the people with those mindsets inspire me the most. I'm not going to ask you which players you don't like to play against, but what other poker players do you really respect, either from what they've done for the game in the past or the guys you play today? I mean, who, when you were growing up, who, do you, who did you like really look up to? And maybe today, who do you respect as a player in the field today? Yep, so um, really most of the people here you have to truly respect. Anyone who's been crushing for over 10 years and playing, still playing these games, it's legendary. Um, but uh, for me coming up, uh, Eric Seidel was a big one. Um, I just watched him a bunch on TV, and I, I met him at a very early stage in my poker career, and he was extremely gracious to me and also just completely tore, tore, and tore me to pieces at the poker table, <laughs> like just absolutely tore me to pieces and was just sitting there listening to his jams, nice and quiet doing it. Isaac Haxon was, is um, the same age as me, but uh, whenever I was coming up online, he was one of the top bosses and uh, ended up becoming... Uh, quite a mentor to me along the way and um, so I really respect him. I think that he's maybe the most underrated poker player even though people rate him very highly. I think that anyone that can play 15 games as well as he can and just 
he's a true master of, of the theory of the game and probably the most intelligent poker player I've ever met. I mean, there's a lot of these freaks out there, but he's definitely one of them. My, my true mentor um, is um, Ben Tolerine, was my roommate, and he was my first exposure to what it took to be great. And Let me stop you there. You told us a great story today. You, I think you said 2011. Yeah, 12. You, 12. You were what you thought was a reasonably good poker player. Yeah. And you spent some time with Ben. Mm -hmm. Talk me through what he said to you there. Because I think that's really interesting about how that changed you as a poker player. Yeah, so first of all, him and I are entirely different uh, personality types. Like, I'm, my, um, I'm the kind of person that seeks, uh, I, I seek out inspiration from people. I seek out mentors. I've just always wanted to learn from people and, and always wanted to say, hey, um, you know, I, I'll give anyone whatever I can if they would just give me the ability to learn from them. And he's the kind of guy that's like, doesn't really want to be bothered, loves his life, is very introverted, does his thing and just absolutely crushes, doesn't need anything from anyone, ever. Um, so for him to even open the door to me and give me the chance to be around him, I, I was really thrilled. And then uh, I freaked out because I walked into this room and I was like, I don't even know how to play poker. I've been claiming to be a professional poker player for five years or six years and here's this juggernaut that doesn't think about the game anywhere remotely the same way that I do, not even the same universe. So I realized... And just your bankroll in those days around 200K, and he was 10 plus million. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it was there in those days. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, Sorry to interrupt. No, it's all good. I, yeah, you're right. I had a very, like a, you know, very small bankroll, and this is a guy that would play anyone at the highest stakes available on the Internet, and... Uh, but couldn't get action. You know, he literally hunted the famous names of everyone thought were the best players. Everybody on the internet was saying was the best player. This guy hunted them, and they wouldn't play him. You know, so just to see that, I thought, well, this is definitely going to be unreachable. But I'm going to give it my best. Um, and so that was like a the rebirth of me. And you know, obviously it was a long road. And um, a really, really lonely road, not just because of the times of Black Friday and kind of being by myself adrift in Canada, but also just losing myself in the grind and trying to, um, like I said, relearn a game that I thought I knew very well. So if you were giving some advice to players today, it was, it was interesting talking to people like Namley and JC Tran and even Phil. Back in their day, mm -hmm. there was nowhere you could go. There wasn't YouTube or internet to read about all this theory. But sure. today, there's an enormous amount of information out there for mm -hmm. aspiring poker players. Yeah. And you've got a lot of very bright people that now have a lot of resource to them. If you were to summarize what you've spent 10, 12 years learning, and you, I know you still do your homework every day, what would, you, what would your advice be to somebody that wants to become? What do, you need, what do you think they need to do today as a balance of learning, playing, playing online, mm. playing offline? How would you summarize that? Well, the, uh, the starting point, just like anything else, you need to be playing the game for the right reasons. If you're one of these people who's like, oh, I have a buddy, he made $100,000 last year playing poker, and I really would love to have $100,000, so I'm going to go play poker, it's not going to work for you. The first hand of poker I was ever dealt, I was lost in it. It was like the craziest, I, I've never experienced anything like it to this day. It was like, I was dealt a hand of poker, and I was like, this is it. Like, it really, the first night, I was like, this is it for me. Maybe I have a gambling problem. I don't know. <laughs> but, like, whatever this thing is, I got to keep doing it. And the, the days just melted. You know, it was like I was just in a fast track, just playing hands, playing hands, playing hands. So if you play it and you love it, then that's the first step. And if you feel that, the first thing you need to do is you just have to be in the chair, whether it's online or live. You have to gain experience. Like, you can take an online poker course and learn fundamentals and this and that. But until you kind of develop a sense of what it's like to be in action and just how the game works, just the nuts and bolts of the game by just, I think it's almost better to just go in blind and just play and play terribly and kind of, oh, maybe I shouldn't call here. Maybe I should raise here. Maybe, you know, this and that. And then after you've got, you have a baseline of kind of having a, a notebook of questions, then you can go online and start to find the answers. But I think if you do it, just straight jump into an online training course before you play poker, uh, I, don't, I don't think it'll work for you. Let's say you're a medium to advanced level poker player, really good amateur, beginner pro. Mm -hmm. 
which is the same state you were at basically yeah. 12 years ago. What would you do from now with all the information available? Is there any one site you'd go to? Would you be selecting different, you know, learning tools from different places? You don't have to name them today, sure. but how do you see that? Because also a lot of the stuff today is based on data. Obviously mm -hmm. a lot of analytical data and listening to you guys, some of the data is great, some's terrible, some's mm -hmm. mixed. How do, how do you, what, what, what's your advice to that level of play? Well, the, I would say training sites are great, but what is much more important is to seek out a coach that fits for your learning style because what they can do is help you decipher through, like you were saying, infinite quantities of information that are available on the internet and learn what things work and what things, what information is good, what information is bad. There's a ton of poker disinformation even on educational sites and stuff that's laying out there. So you don't need to find the best poker player in the world. I would actually say if you're, say, a mid-level pro, find someone who's you've played against who crushes the games that you play already and go to them and see if they'll coach you. Don't go to the guy that's $5,000 an hour that's playing Tritons. Go to the guy that's $500 an hour who's just a lot better than you and start to learn from him. And you also learn things about the player pool that you're currently in, which is, it's, it's very important to be in touch with your own player pool. Yeah, that's, that's very true. So really poker is not a lot different to tennis or golf. Often the coach may not be have been the greatest of players, mm -hmm. but they're just great coaches. Yes. So you think it's a combination of that. Uh, obviously, the coach has to have played, as most tennis coaches have played. Mm -hmm. One thing about poker, it's, it's one of those games where most sports, if you make a mistake, you get a second chance. You lose a set in tennis, you lose a game in tennis, you can come back. Mm -hmm. um, in poker, you can play for three days. You work, Once you make a mistake, you're done. The yeah. only other sport I can think of which is similar is probably boxing Box. and martial arts. <laughs> yeah, one mistake, you're out cold <laughs> okay. on the floor. If you look back at something you're not the word, I don't like to use the word bad beat worst mistake you've made during a poker tournament could be bad diet bad preparation what's, what's the biggest mistake you've made which had the biggest outcome um, I specifically remember one that I I'm much more forgiving to myself now about it because looking back at the actual circumstances but I believe I made a small seven figure ICM punt um, at, at a Triton once so in Jeju, there was, a, I believe, a two hundred dollars or $250,000 buy-in a U.S. No Limit Hold'em tournament. And I made the final table, and I bagged, and I had a good stack. And then I got a call that there was a massive cash game. And so I jumped in the seat, and I played a huge cash game after playing all day. And I played until it was the final table of the two hundred fifty k without sleeping. And I think I had to do it because the cash game was so important. It was kind of one of those like once in a year opportunities. So, but my stack at this final table was probably worth two and a half, three million dollars. So it was a, a really huge. Did, did you win enough cash to cover that? On that? I actually, it's, I, I can't remember what the result was okay. in the cash game. I don't think I got destroyed because I remember I was, was okay. tired, but I was in good spirits. But then I went in and I played a pot against one of the greatest poker players of all time, Makita Bajiakuski, and. Um, my head melted, and I just I, I made a, a pretty big punt, um, and I definitely wouldn't have made it if I would have slept. Too fresh. Okay. Yeah. And if there's a, you know, I, I know if you talk to us a bit about your, fa you know, you found balance in your life talking yeah. to you, which is really important. Tell us a bit about your family. My intro to that would be: I think if you're going to be great at poker, and this probably applies to a lot of things, you have to start without balance. Like the only thing that can ever matter. Your poker. life has to be set up to just be a poker player. You have to be sick, basically. Like, I mean, it's just the truth. Like, um, not to go on too much of a tangent, but like you were saying, some there are a lot of great coaches out there that weren't great performers. The the greatest poker players not only is poker life to them, but they're also the most determined to win. Like, all they want to do is win at poker. Like, it's not just play poker. They need to win at poker. When they lose, they never forget how whether it be one hand or a session, they never forget. They're ultra critical on themselves, I think, most of them, and obsessive about winning. So I went through that period, and I don't think that I could be where I'm at today without that. But after, you know, I found my wife, and uh, we built our life, and through lots of obsession, we, I grinded away, and, and we, did, we did good, a lot of support from her. But now it, I can take my foot off the gas. You know, and, and thank God, I really desired to do that. I mean, it took years off my life. I feel like grinding those Macau games and grinding the app games and playing nosebleed cash games and tournaments all day, every day. Um, but yeah, with her in my life, uh, everything 
she accepted the grind with me and she supported me through it and and now we're at the point where it's let's cool out we have a 17 month old son and we have uh, another son on the way uh, at the end of june and um you know this is my longest trip away from them uh, it'll be almost three weeks away from them which is uh which is rough you know it's hard but i'm excited to get home and uh and yeah, we, we really do live one of the most balanced lives I've seen for a hardcore poker player, that's for sure. Yeah, I think any top athlete, you're right, I think there's a degree of selfishness that you have to have yeah. uh, if you're going to get to the very top of your field. Would you, uh, would you encourage your boy to play poker down the line or not, or leave it completely to him? I'm definitely going to introduce it to him and play it. I, I think it's really the most beautiful game. I mean, what other game can you do for a living and then you go on vacation and you want to do it for fun? You know, it's, so I, I want my kids to to learn poker at a very young age and learn about critical thinking and, and, and learn about strategy. So certainly going to introduce it to him and try to teach him high-level poker, but by no means ever expect him to try to do it for a living. I also admire your discipline that you stay out of the pits. You don't casino gamble. You stick to what you're good at. You understand odds. Yeah. Explain to me why you think so many poker players are degenerate casino gamblers and, what, and it, it takes so many of them down. Why is that? It's just I, I think it's the nature of the business that we're in is most people here like you know i have some level of gamble in me i i if i you know i i'm taking on tons of risk in these games um but i i think that some people you can see it in them it's like losing is almost as good as winning you know i, I can't really explain it even a lot of the most talented poker players of all time had that sickness it's just something that's just in the nature of gambling so i think that you're going to attract some phenoms that are incredibly talented, but at the end of the day, they'll never be able to overcome other leagues. The leagues, yeah. So for, to wrap up, talk us through some. You get being that it's a strange thing. You're one of the best poker players in the world. Professional poker players regard you as a challenge. Yet you get invited as a poker player as a, as yeah. a, to some of the most fun games in the world. Yeah. Where you're clearly a huge favourite. Yet they yeah. still invite you. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, obviously, you know, uh, some, talk us through some of the, th the games you get to go to that you can. Um, the ones, maybe some of the charitable ones or the art foundation things. Some of the things, of the things you go to, yeah. what are the people like in those tournaments? What's the difference in the vibe between that sort of tournament versus uh, a Triton tournament? So um, uh, one of the cash games that I've, I've been uh, fortunate enough to play in is just I'm just surrounded by titans of industry uh, in the Bay Area. And they're all brilliant guys. They're not there. They, they invite me there because, one, it's small stakes to them, and we all get to talk about poker, and they love poker, and they love learning about it. I totally understand. Um, and for me, it's just the greatest gift because I just get to sit there and, and listen to them talk business or, or philosophy. And, and like I was telling you in our conversations, and often you know, I reach out to you for advice mm -hmm. because you're a person who I would consider in a very similar uh, circle to those guys. Um, I'm trying my best to play catch up on the way that the world works. You know, I feel like kind of had my head in the sand and, and playing poker and that's great. But like, I, I, maybe it's the responsibility that I feel bringing kids into the world that I really want to know. I want to want to know how it all works, how it all fits together. How can I plan for the future? You know, um, so getting to be around, uh, people that have accomplished so much and, and these guys are modern day philosophers and just hear them talk is just, the most amazing gift. So I think that, um, you know, if, if I've mentored someone in poker who I know is genuine, um, I don't mind giving them my time or my energy because I see a bit of myself in, in them, you know. And I think that maybe they see someone who is really hungry and they probably had that hunger at some point in their life. And, and it, it just feels really great to give back. And I think that that's why a lot of these um, amazing people don't mind having me around. I feel extremely blessed to get to... You have a Rolodex of contacts that any yeah. journalist from the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal would love because yeah. you can say, hey, what's going on to people yeah. they can never get an interview with. So I think, you know, for great sportsmen, and I, I, mean, I would regard you as that, poker, I believe poker's a sport because of the thing like that. A lot of it's about legacy. And you've always said to me, longevity is part of your legacy and obviously mm -hmm. teaching other people. Anything else, you'd, you know, if you were to be remembered in 50 years' time for what you contributed to poker or what you, know, what you think you... What, what would you like to be remembered as? That's a great question. It's not something I've really thought about, uh, but I would say I would like my opponents to all say that I was a tenacious competitor, that I was a person that 
you know, I try to be a warm soul, but I hope that they all can say that I never really gave much away. You know, like when I sit down, I'm absolutely there to win. Um, and but not be a prick about it. Not be a prick about it, but, but I am there to win. I don't care if it's the smallest tournament I'm playing or the biggest tournament. I want to be always on my A game. And I really pride myself on bringing that, like you were saying, whether it's physical or mental preparation. When I sit down at the table, um, I'm extremely confident that I'm going to deliver. I'm going to be prepared, and I'm going to deliver at a very, very high level. And I've done that for a really, really long time. I think that that's hard to do. Life throws a lot of stuff at you. And I can't recall the last time I played my C game. I just can't recall it, you know. It's great to hear. Jason, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, of course. Good luck in the rest of the tournament, mate. Thanks. Good to see you, mate. Cheers.